Okay. So as we kind of touched those points last week uh, for clarification, I hope that that was something that was able to um, do what I hoped, you know, and bring clarification to some of the things that were, might have left us confused a little bit. So today we did touch on a little bit that we're going to touch on tonight um, by, by going to um, Romans chapter one, starting in verse eight. I'm going to read verses eight through verse 18. So if you want to turn with me to Romans one, verses eight through 18. Paul says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am both, I am debtor both to, to the Greeks and to the barbarians both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the, to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So when I sent out the email, I put on the email a couple of points that hopefully we're going to be able to uh, explain today by going over these scriptures. The first one is what is the spiritual gift Paul talks about in verse 11 and why is it important? But as we touched on last week, I want to, to remind us what we said a little bit about verses eight and um, verse nine. Verse eight, where Paul says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now we pointed out last week that the Romans met basically in-house churches. They were basically like we are, a small group, only they were together in one place, but they were small churches. And um, as we get further into Romans, we will see more and more of this, especially in the conclusion as he starts naming these house churches. So the Romans met in house churches. And the, the, the thing here that is, to me, stands out the most is that their faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. And um, last week, when we talked about that, um, we talked about, I, I wanna say um, it was, I said something about asking my kids at some point in their life, you know, what do you want the first thing someone to say or come to their mind about you when they think of you? When they think of Karen, what do I want the first thing someone to say about me? What is that? Well, here I would say that Paul tells them what that is. Your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. And um, I had the pleasure of having lunch this week with Sharice, who's not able to be with us tonight, but um, she commented on that. And she and, and Laurie here are, are actually blood relation family. And they, Lori's grandmother, um, wasn't she Sharice's great grandmother? Okay. Great, great. Great, great grandmother. Yes. Sharice is my cousin's daughter. Okay. 
So I asked Sharice, when was the last time she got to see Lori? And she said, at this great, great grandmother's funeral. And she said, when we talked about the faith. I'm of, sorry, you're right. <laughs> One great, her kids are, are great, great grandkids. Okay. <laughs> so Lori's grandmother is Sharice's great grandmother. So when Sharice was recounting this, we were talking about the lesson and just a lot of things. And she said something that she thought about was, was that grandmother, that that was the first thing. She said, when you said that, what would be the first thing you would want somebody to think about when they thought about you? She thought about that grandmother and how when Paul says your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world, that she could definitely say that about their grandmother, that it was her faith that she stood out to, to Charisse you know, that, and, and to everybody that knew her. So what a statement that Paul makes to them here. Your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So I think that that's very significant when we in this land of technology today, in the land of mega churches, in the land of all kinds of things that we as a small group can still be impactful by the faith of Christ that is within us as we let Christ's life be our life to other people. So I thought that was important to just touch on that one more time. So um, as we move along in verse nine, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Paul lets them know, I'm not praying for a vacation. I'm not praying for a nice trip to Italy. I'm praying for a purpose, for the will of God to come unto you. And a lot of times I think that um, we pray for specific things and specific purposes. And certainly I still pray for, for physical things, but ultimately our prayers need to be focused on the spiritual Paul models that for us. And even right here, that I may have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. He models his, his prayer is not for himself. It's not for his needs to be met or even his desires. It's for the will of God. And so I think that's very, very important that we notice that. So as we closed last week, I said, I really want to spend some time this week on this verse 11 and following. And so if you're following along in your book, we're on page 13, but we're gonna be in Romans one, verse 11. I'm gonna say that again. And then verse 12, uh, for I long to see you. Paul says, I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end, ye may be established. Now, I want you to notice something right there at the end of that verse in your Bible. At the end of that verse is a colon. And what that means is that when you have a colon, what comes after the colon is basically an answer to what comes before it or some expounding on what came before it. So after that word established, we have a colon. So what we're fixing to read gives us insight as to what this spiritual gift to the end you may be established is. And verse 12 says, that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, this is gonna cover these first two points that I put in the email. What is the spiritual gift Paul talks about and why is it important? And what is the mutual faith? both of you and me. So now when we turn to our, uh, our commentary, Paul's prayer, as I mentioned a while ago, is not a selfish one. He's not asking God for that nice vacation like we'd all probably like, but he's not interested in that. He wants to come to Rome to impart unto them a spiritual gift. Most of the time today, when spiritual gift is, it, the word spiritual gift is used, especially in today's society, or if you have any dealings at all with a churchianity type background that talks about the spiritual gifts that are speaking in tongues, laying on of hands, 
that commission that Jesus gave the apostles in Mark chapter 16, where they would lay hands on the sick and they would recover, um, all of those speaking with new tongues, that's what most people would equate a spiritual gift to. That's not what he's talking about here, but he uses the term spiritual gift, physical healings and the other gifts. And we'll get into those a little bit later in our study, but they don't have the ability to establish you. And I thought about, we, we touched last week on that word establish. So I, I looked it up just to be able to give you a concrete definition of it. So he's longing to impart a spiritual gift that would establish them. To establish means to set fast, to turn resolutely in a certain direction, to confirm, to fix, to steadfastly set, to strengthen, to set up on a firm or permanent basis. And then we talked about the contrast of that word last week without the E, and that was to establish. So what the word establish, and the good thing about our Bible, our preserved word of God in the King James Bible is that he uses the words in this Bible that he intended to use. They haven't been changed. This is the preserved, accurate word of God for us today. So when we use that word established, that's what it means to set fast, you know, steadfastly set and to establish, we're going to come across that word as mentioned last week in the last chapter of Romans in verse 25. And when that word establish is used, and you're going to find it in other places in your Bible, but when that word establish is used, it is that which causes you to remain established. So if I'm going to put a, a, a today example on that, my house is setting on a foundation, a concrete foundation. When they poured this foundation, most likely, well, it was a long time ago, but most likely they put supports in, in the concrete or in the place where the concrete was going to go. The concrete is something that we build upon. It sets a foundation but the rebar that goes inside that foundation that we don't even see is what actually causes it to be strong. So the establishment is going to be the foundation. The establishment is going to be like that rebar in the concrete of a foundation, that which causes it to be strong. So as we go forth here, we have, and, and Paul will be making some distinguished distinguishing comments as he uh, pins the book of Romans that we can make this comparison contrasting that word established versus established. So um, I just kind of wanted to bring that out. So what he came to impart was a spiritual gift that has the, the that to the end, ye may be established, firm, firmly set, steadfastly set. So um, Christians, let's see, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Spiritual gift uh, that Paul wants to impart to the Romans, like I said, is that that will establish them so that they are not tossed to and fro. You want your house to stand. You don't want that, that foundation to shift and move because if you do have a foundation that shifts and move, your house has the ability to eventually fold in on itself. That's not what we want to do here. We want to stand firm. So uh, they're not tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. This gift cannot be the speaking in tongues because no one is established in that. Remember the colon at the end of that, that verse. The spiritual gift is the mutual faith both of both Paul and the Romans in the mystery doctrine for today. I'm going to say that again. The spiritual gift is the mutual faith of both Paul and the Romans in the mystery doctrine for today. The doctrine that Paul teaches us in Romans is that which has the power to establish us to the end. That's what we're going to build on is that sound doctrine that he gives us. This sets the purpose of the book of Romans as foundational doctrine 
for our current but now dispensation of grace. Paul will cover our sin. He will cover our justification. He will cover our sanctification in the first eight chapters of Romans to impart that spiritual gift. Unfortunately, and, and I, you've probably heard this, maybe you've even taken this test yourself. Uh, some Christians will seek to find out what are my spiritual gifts? And man in man's wisdom has come up with quizzes and questions that they can ask that you can see where your strengths and your weaknesses are. And well, you must be gifted in this area or you must be gifted in that area. That's not what this is talking about here. This giftedness, this spiritual gift is not your talents. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the sound doctrine that comes from reading and believing God's word. So <clears throat> we need to be first and foremost focused in these first eight chapters of Romans on that so that we can be doctrinally established in Christ. So for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. We're gonna get down a little bit further and I'm gonna bring us back up to that mutual faith and kind of ex expound on that, but I'm gonna move on just for the sake of being able to keep in the right context. Verse 13, now would not have you ignorant brethren that oftentimes I purpose to come to you, but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you, even you also, even as among other Gentiles. Paul had been wanting to come to the Romans, uh, but had been unable to do so. This is to our benefit, uh, since he had to write down a foundational mystery doctrine instead of speaking it to them. Now, today we talked about this morning, we talked a lot about that mystery doctrine. We're going to get more into it in this book of Romans. And, and so he wrote it down to them instead of speaking it to them in the book of Romans. God preserved this for us so that we also may be established in this doctrine. Also note that Paul refers to other Gentiles here, which tells us that the Romans are Gentiles too. So in verse 14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So who are these Greeks and these barbarians? The Greeks and the barbarians are all Gentiles. Now, when I read that a long time ago, I didn't put that together, that we're talking about Gentiles. I'm seeing different people groups here being mentioned, and I didn't put that together until coming to this type of Bible study, but the Greeks and the barbarians are Gentiles, just like you and me. The difference is that the Greeks were Gentiles with an education. Remember in, in one place, our word tells us that the, the Jews seek after a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greeks are Gentiles with an education, while the barbarians were uneducated Gentiles as the last past of this verse defines the terms for you. You see where it says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise Greeks and to the unwise, the barbarians. So it defines that for us, scripture defining scripture. The reason Paul is a debtor to all Gentiles is because a dispensation of the gospel was committed unto Paul. As such, necessity is laid upon him to preach the gospel. I want to talk about that just a second. And Eric gives us a scripture reference there, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16 through 17. So what does it mean that a dispensation of the gospel was committed to Paul and a necessity was laid upon him? Well, I wrote this scripture down so I could share it with you. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 and 17 says this, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. So when Paul preaches the gospel, 
He wants to make sure that he's not glorying or boasting in his ability to do so. I'm not glorying in this for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So what does that necessarily mean? Paul was given a dispensation of the gospel, a commission by Jesus Christ. We talked about that commission a couple of weeks back when I brought out the scriptures in Acts where Jesus Christ commissioned Paul himself. So that dispensation was given to him. So a dispensation Hang on just one second. I have a little noise issue. I'm sorry. A dispensation of the gospel is uh, given unto him. So out of necessity, it is a need. A necessity is a need uh, is laid upon him to give this gospel. So it's not in, in him to glory in it or for his glory at all. So he says, I'm, I'm not going to do that. But he says, uh, if I do this thing willingly, and he does, I have a reward. But if against my will, he still has the dispensation of the gospel committed unto him. So regardless, he can unwillingly do this, and he he loses reward but if he willingly does this he says i have a reward because this dispensation of the gospel is given to me and you need it and basically when we're reading the first part of romans romans one through i think i mentioned through i guess three and a half chapters three verse 21 it is this call giving to us this um, idea that we have need of what he has. He just told us it's a spiritual gift that has the ability to establish us to the end that we would be established. So that is the, the dispensation that was given to him. It was a necessity, but he did it willingly. I long to see you, he says. So this dispensation of the gospel given to him um, because as such necessity is laid upon him to preach the gospel. Therefore, he owes a debt to all unsaved people to preach the gospel to them. That's the necessity. Christ gave it to him, gave him this dispensation, revealed it to him, this mystery gospel. So now he has this thing that is necessary for other people. It's laid upon him. He owes a debt to all unsaved people to preach the gospel to them. This also shows that God is willing to save all people, regardless of how smart they are. He says, I, I owe, in verse 14, I am debtor to both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. This gospel, this dispensation of the gospel is given to both whether we're educated or we're uneducated. And that's kind of important to do, to, to understand too. We live in a society where it is, we, we said at one point, um, climbing the ladder. Society climbs this ladder of success and it's based on your education or your, your status, your stature in life. Well, the gospel is not based on that. It is to everyone, regardless of what ladder you've climbed in society. The gospel is for everyone, whether, whether you're wise or you're unwise, whether you're smart or whether you're educated. In fact, it is often the unwise people who believe the gospel. And we've talked about that before. People that are wise in their own, whether they've worked for their education or whatever, they have a tendency to think they are self-made. I did it my way. And they don't want to think they even have need of a savior, but they do. So, but unwise people, most of the time, it's us. 
It's us who will believe the gospel because the world by wisdom, it says, knew not God. And that's 1 Corinthians 1, 21. And um, so I want to read that to you for 1 Corinthians 1, 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So by wisdom, the world knew not God. So that's talking about worldly wisdom. So they, they think that they have all the answers. They think that they have it all right. But by that wisdom, by the wisdom of man, they knew not God. So it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that would believe. And that's you and I. That's you and I. So Paul says in verse 15, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. So he's been given this dispensation of the gospel and it is necessity that is laid upon him. He's made a trip to the Romans. He's prayed for that trip, longing to see them to impart this spiritual gift unto them that to the end they would be established. And as through that, we too are partakers of this. So although Paul wrote to the saints in Rome, there were many lost people in Rome and he had been commissioned by Christ to preach the gospel. Therefore, he wants to come to Rome for two purposes. One is to show the saints that they need to count the flesh as dead and walk in the spirit. And we're going to get into that as we get further into chapters six through eight. And two, to give the gospel to the unsaved in Rome. So that is um, kind of goes along with the twofold will of God. The twofold will of God is found in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. The twofold will of God is that every man be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. So when we think about that in relation to Paul's desire to come to them for the purpose that he has, that makes sense. And it makes that puzzle piece come together for that twofold uh, will of God for mankind. In verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Again, we have a colon right there after the word Christ. So what we're fixing to read is going to give us some definition here. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, that is a, a scripture that is so important that we understand. It is so important. He says that it is the gospel that has the power unto salvation. What does that mean to you and to me? That means it's not about my performance. That means it's not about what I do. That means, you know, it's not what Christ did and then what I do. It is all him. It is the gospel of Christ that is that power of salvation. And what I have to do is believe it. Christians like to use this verse to say that we should proudly proclaim the gospel and not be ashamed that we are Christians. However, Paul's statement here that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ speaks more of the gospel's contents than of Paul's boldness. In other words, in presenting the gospel, Paul is not like a used car salesman trying to sell you a lemon. You ever bought a lemon? You ever bought a car that you're thinking, okay, you know, I can't afford to get the new thing this time or whatever, what, for whatever reason, we have to budget and we, we go buy a car and then every other day, something is going wrong on the car. We've been there. We've been there and we've done that. But here, Paul is not like this used car salesman, polishing it up, making it look pretty, making everything shine. He's not doing that. He's not trying to sell us a lemon. Rather, he tells us that his gospel is the power of God unto salvation. He has the best product ever. 
Therefore, there is no shame in proclaiming the gospel. So he can with boldness say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. When you think about the life of Paul, as we read back in Acts, when he came to the, his conversion, he knew who he was. He knew that the people knew who he was. The persecutor of Christians, the, ones, the one that stood at the feet when Stephen was stoned and, you know, consented unto his death, he says. He knew who he was. But when it comes to the gospel, he says, I'm not ashamed. He was ashamed of that, who he was. But now he's been given this dispensation of the gospel that has the power to establish us. It's a doctrine. And also that in it, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the reason that Paul says that the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek is because when Jesus commissioned Paul, he commissioned him to go to all unsaved people, Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles. And from Acts 9 until Acts 28, unsaved Jews were diminishing away meaning they still had an opportunity to hear and believe the gospel. When Paul went to a city to preach, his manner was to go to the Jewish synagogue first because Jesus told him he would preach or to, he was to present this to Jews and Gentiles, to kings. He was to present this to everybody. So he would go to the Jewish synagogue first and then go to the Gentiles. That was his manner of doing it. Since Paul probably wrote the book of Romans, and you might want to jot this down, it's just good information to know. He probably wrote the book of Romans around the time of Acts 20, verses 1 through 3. I always think it's interesting to look back at that to see what was actually going on in Acts 20, and to know that that's when Paul actually penned the book of Romans. He, at that time, was still following this pattern, which is why he says that the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, after Acts 28, the end of Acts, before we turned the page into Romans, that was no longer his pattern. But that's why he says that, and you'll hear him say that multiple times as we go through his gospels, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So verse 17 he says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, I'm going to couple that with verse 18, because that's how Eric has it, has it written here. But we're going to go back up to that mutual faith in a few minutes as we start talking about from faith to faith. But verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So if you'll notice um, in verse, um, well, I want to point this out before I go there. In verse 16, Paul uses the words, uh, the gospel of Christ, the term, the gospel of Christ. This is another tidbit to, that's very interesting. It's on page 14 in our book. He uses this term gospel of Christ because the glad tidings are to trust in what Christ did, his death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins. By contrast, when we started the book of Romans in the very first verse, he uses the term, the gospel of God. So what is that difference there? The gospel of Christ, or the gospel of God. The gospel of God from verse chapter one, verse one is a general term that applies to all gospels in all dispensations. That is why the gospel of God was promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, while no such notation is made regarding the gospel of Christ. So when we crossed over from the gospel of God, meaning just a general term used for all dispensations, Paul's dispensation is of the gospel of Christ. And that is 
important to note. I'm having all kinds of technical issues here tonight. <laughs> I'm just apologizing right now. I have these pop-ups coming up on my screen and I'm thinking, what in the world? My heater was kicking on. I'm pouring sweat here. I'm thinking, this is just, I don't know what's going on here, but I am sweating. Anyway, slight diversion. I'm sorry. So back to what we're talking about here. Paul is willing to look foolish pre uh, preaching the gospel, proclaiming the gospel because of the predicament the world is in. The wrath of God, this is in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Note, now this is might be confusing right now for you to try to put this in your brain, but I'm going to say it anyway, that it is revealed. It is revealed in his word, but it is not actually on people yet. Because as believers, it's important for you to know this. God has delivered us from the wrath to come. That's 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And I wrote that down to share it with you. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he hath raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. So what happened? What happened when you um, believed the gospel? When you recognized you're a sinner, you trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, a lot of things happened. Maybe not things that you could physically see, but a lot of things happened in that you were given the gift of the Holy Spirit that now dwells within you. And also this very major thing, you were saved from the wrath to come. So I want to point out right there, wrath to come. I want you to remember our divisions in the word, time past, but now, and ages to come. So when the Bible talks about, when the word of God talks about wrath to come, that's going to be in the ages to come that you and I will not have to deal with. We don't have to worry about that because we believe the gospel of Christ that was given to Paul to dispense to us right now in the dispensation of grace. The way to avoid this wrath is to get God's righteousness. And the only way we can get God's righteousness is by believing the gospel and the gospel of Christ. Therefore, Paul does not mind using preaching. That's why he says, I'm, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says in verse 15, I am ready to preach the gospel. He does not mind using preaching since it means that some people will believe the gospel and become righteous and not receive the wrath of God upon them. You know, people have no idea. They think that, you know, how can things get worse than what they are today in our society? How can things possibly progress further than what they are today? Well, when the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, against all ungodliness, there is no, nothing comparable to that that will be on this earth. So those who will never believe the gospel, they will experience God's wrath upon them at the great white throne judgment. And that's told in Revelation 20, way, way, way in the future of what, where we are today. So I want to talk about this faith to faith, the comment that he makes in verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now there's two faiths mentioned in that scripture. So what is that about? There's two faiths necessary for salvation. When you and I place our faith in Christ, who was faithful to go to the cross, we're saved. Thus, the righteousness of God comes upon man when man places his faith in Christ's faith, okay? The quote of the just shall live by faith Julie, do you have something 
Okay. The quote of the just shall live by faith comes from Habakkuk 2.4. Now, Habakkuk is um, an Old Testament book, be considered a minor prophet just because of the, the length of the book. But he says in chapter 2, verse 4, in relation to not trusting your own righteousness, it actually says this. And I love the way Habakkuk penned this. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So the his is not talking about my own faith. The his is talking about the faith of Jesus Christ. The just shall live by his faith. So my faith, this faith to faith, my faith brings me to the place of Christ's faith. My faith is placed into Christ's faith, which is then placed in me. The faith of Christ is placed in me. The just shall live by his faith, which may indicate that a person becomes just by believing the gospel. And the reason that justification occurs is because of the faith of Jesus Christ. So this verse means, Eric says, may mean the just man shall live by Christ's faith. Now, I want to share something with you that we talked about earlier today, and it's, it's in a different book, but I, I think it's relatable to us right here. And um, we're studying 1 Corinthians on Thursday mornings. And when we were talking today, it talks about... Um, man's wisdom and godly wisdom and and all of this kind of thing and it compares spiritual things with spiritual talks about that and the way the holy ghost teaches us and so the way the holy ghost teaches us the things of god is exactly that by comparing spiritual things with spiritual and there are two important uh meanings of this first it means that the holy ghost takes the spiritual things of one passage of God's word and compares it to the spiritual things of another passage in God's word. That shows us that we learn by cross-referencing the in the Bible. And I mentioned this morning how grateful I am for people who do that because I have learned so much from Eric and others who are great at that cross-referencing. They can pop it off just like this well, it says this here and it says this here, and we have been able to glean and learn from those people, and that's awesome. And Eric says in his First Corinthians book that that's why he uses a lot of scripture, because it's spiritual things compared with spiritual things. So if we wrote the Bible, we would probably not do it the way God wrote it. We would have a chapter on salvation. We would have a chapter on baptism. We would have a chapter on circumcision. We would have a chapter on um, spiritual gifts. We would have a chapter on sanctification and salvation. But we, God puts these things specifically in throughout his word that we can diligently seek him. Hebrews eleven six says that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we have to be diligent in order to put these passages together. I bring up Habakkuk 2.4 in relation to Romans 1.17, because that's spiritual things with spiritual things. Romans 1.17, the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by his faith. So we get a little bit more each time. The second thing that's important about comparing spiritual things with spiritual is that the Holy Ghost, whom we now have, who is a spirit, teaches our, our spirit the spiritual things of God. And the natural man, those outside, the unbeliever, cannot receive those spiritual things of God. Well, I want to share something with you uh, about this, the just shall live by faith. The importance of the faith of Christ. Is my faith important? My faith is important in that it brought me to, to Christ. But now this faith to faith is important 
even more so. And I'm going to take you to Galatians 2.20. I have it written down if you, if you want to just listen to it or you can turn to it. Galatians 2.20. In your King James Bible says this. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The importance of us understanding our the word of God as it's written in the King James Bible, for us to understand what is this spiritual gift that Paul talks about, that to the end we may be established. What is this mutual faith that he talks about? What is this gospel of Christ that is the power of God into salvation? What are these things? Well, I want to share this Galatians 2.20 with you in two other translations. One of them is the New Living Translation. Now, the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by his faith. Just read Galatians 2.20. Um, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, okay? This is Galatians 2.20 in the New Living Translation. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, says nothing about the faith of Christ. Nothing about it. Now, when I read it to you in another paraphrased translation, this is the message, and I can't even distinguish where verse 20 actually is in the message. I have to read it in its paragraph form. So this is verses 19, Galatians 2, verses 19 through 21. It says, what actually took place is this. I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God, and it didn't work. So I quit being a lawman so that I could be God's man. Christ's life showed me how and enabled me to do it. I identified myself completely with him. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion. And I am no longer driven to impress God. Christ lives in me. The life you see me living is not mine, but is lived by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am not going to go back on that. Wow. That's a pretty big wow. Either way you say it, frontwards or backwards. Wow. Wow. The importance of us reading and believing God's word as it is preserved for us today in the King James Bible is that the terminology and the wording matters. It means something that when I read from faith to faith, I understand that it is about my faith, but that my faith only does one thing, brings me to his faith. So when, when Paul says here in Romans 1 verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The nature of the revealed word of God, this spirit comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And when I can put that together with Habakkuk 2.4 and Galatians 2.20, I understand that that faith to faith is much deeper than what I just read to you in the paraphrase of the Message Bible and even the paraphrase of the New Living Translation. I, uh, the New Living Translation, I have one. 
and I used to read it all the time, but never do I read it now to study by because it is important that I understand the word of God as it is preserved for me. Why? So when we go back up to verse 11, I can be established. To the end, I can be established. The only place I can do that is if I have the true word of God before me and I'm able to do that in there. So the faith to faith, refers to the two faiths necessary for salvation. When I place my faith in Christ, who was faithful to go to the cross, you are saved. I am saved. Thus, the righteousness of God comes upon man when man places his faith in Christ's faith. That's what that faith to faith is. The just shall live by his faith. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So I'm going to go up and um, I don't, I don't think I shared about that unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So, refers to man's status before believing the gospel for salvation. Regardless of the dispensation, men have the opportunity to have faith in God because God has revealed himself to man both externally and internally. I don't want to go to this scripture tonight um, because there's too much involved in it, which will be our next one for next week, but God has revealed himself. He has made himself manifest to all men, and we will read that next week. So people who hold the truth in unrighteousness, it's not that they haven't been given the truth, but they refuse to believe the gospel for salvation. So regardless of the dispensation, we have men have the opportunity to have faith in God because God has revealed himself to man. Therefore, all men hold the truth. If they do not have faith in God, they are unrighteous. If they have faith in God, I mean, if they don't have faith in God, they are unrighteous and they hold the truth in unrighteousness. The only way you and I can be righteous is by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what is this gospel that Paul talks about? It's very quickly summed up in two scriptures. Those two scriptures are found in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. And it says this, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what Paul came to you, to me, to these Romans, to us, to give. The spiritual gift is this mutual faith of sound doctrine, mutual faith, the faith of Christ. We share that. That's our mutual faith, is the faith of Christ. So when I look at my points from, from earlier, what is the spiritual gift? Why is it important? The spiritual gift is the sound doctrine that Paul talks about, that he teaches us through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We have to believe that it was kept hidden from the foundation of the world and was revealed only when it was revealed to Paul the very first time. What is the mutual faith, both of you and me? That's part of the spiritual gift. It's the faith of Christ, the faith of Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? 1 Corinthians 15, three through four. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the atonement of our sins. And what is meant 
by faith to faith, my faith to Christ's faith, my faith in Christ's faith. Therefore, now I live by the faith of Christ. If I choose to read a paraphrase translation, and a lot of people do because they believe that it's easier to, to understand. That's not coming from the wisdom of God. That's coming from man's wisdom. And in, in our First Corinthians book, Eric wrote it this way. He says, when you use God's word, you are using words which the Holy Ghost teacheth. That is why it's important to use a King James Bible. If you use a paraphrased translation, you are using the words of man's wisdom. The Holy Ghost uses God's words, not man's words. So this chapter, first chapter in Romans is so vital that we understand these points. And I am going to apologize again because I know tonight has been very scattered, but I hope that there've been a few nuggets that you've been able to take from it. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know why it happens this way. It just does sometimes that the elements around you will just keep piling up on top of you. And you think, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? So I just hope that it's, it's been something for you tonight. Um, we're going to close right here. Father, we thank you for this night. Lord, I have to sometimes even chuckle because um, if it's not the internet messing up, it's my heater kicking on, it's the, my phone ringing, it's other elements. Father, it's evident to me that the enemy of our soul does not want your word to go out. He does not want people to hear the gospel as you have so eloquently penned it by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost through our Apostle Paul. Father, I pray that as we say goodnight tonight, as we close this Bible study, that there will be something that rests in the minds of each and every one of us as we lay upon our pillow tonight that we can ponder and thank you for. We thank you, Father. For the spiritual gift that Paul gave. We thank you, Father, for our mutual faith. We thank you, Father, for the words of God as penned in the King James Bible. We thank you, Father, that the just shall live by faith, by his faith, the faith of Christ. We thank you for these things, and we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.